The discussion of whether or not the theropod dinosaurs carried a covering of extra oral tissue, or what has been simplified as lips, has been a raging one over the last few years. This has been most contentiously argued online amongst amateurs, armchair experts, and teens suffering from the Dunning-Kruger effect. It has even been turned into somewhat of a political thing, which might be shocking but really comes as no surprise when the lipless condition is common amongst old, nostalgia-based dinosaur representations in popular media. Of course there would be overlap among out-of-touch older folks and people who long for days long since past and sticking to the old, cool idea of teeth-bearing carnivores. The majority of the experts and those who do science, or those who defer to those who do, should not and mostly do not care which way the wind blows, only that it does and has the evidence to do so. A brand new study has just been published that tackles this issue yet again, with more data to add some more insight into the truth of the matter. Before I begin with this video, I recommend going and checking out the three videos I have about teeth. They explain the ins and outs of the anatomy of teeth with strong references to dinosaurs and other extinct animals. Through them, you will learn what dentine, enamel, and periodontium are. I may summarize a bit here, but I am not making it a priority. The history of the back and forth among different voices as to the possibility or truth about extraoral soft tissues in the theropod dinosaurs is now very thick and in-depth. It's not particularly long, there is just a lot of jibber-jabber. In short, all terrestrial vertebrate animals and plenty of aquatic, semi-aquatic, or marine ones all have some form of tissues covering their teeth. The teeth are set firmly in their mouths, and you never see them from the outside. This means that this trait is an evolutionarily shared one that has been kept across every divergence over time. It has been lost in a few groups that have specialized for specific life habits. In mammals, this tissue is called lips. Mammal lips are unique among the vertebrates in being super muscular and super mobile. Some mammals have so much lippage and extraoral tissues that their skull shape is completely obscured. Reptiles have lips too, but these lips are very distinct from mammals. They should be, considering how long ago reptiles and mammals diverged from their shared common ancestor. Lizards and snakes have what are referred to more scientifically as labial scales, skin and muscles where mammal lips are, but they do not function the same way. They are really there to just seal the mouth when it closes. They also often do not obscure the skull shape in the way lips do in mammals. Turtles are toothless and have beaks, so they are out of the discussion. Frogs are so far removed from the rest of the tetrapods and vertebrates that they really shouldn't enter the discussion either, but hey look at that, they have lips too. Most don't have teeth, and those who do have unusual teeth that may or may not count as teeth. Check out my Busted Bones video on frog skeletal anatomy to learn more about them. Lastly are the crocs and birds, the last living archosaurs, and therefore the last living relatives to the dinosaurs. Birds are the last living dinosaurs, making them still technically relatives, but also literally just descendants. Crocs are cousins that split from the archosaur tree a long while before the dinosaurs did. Birds are toothless and beaked. They offer no help to us. Crocs are quite distant to dinosaurs, but are technically the closest thing we have to that lineage, but are also extremely adapted to their specific habits. They are quite advanced reptiles, and their adaptations are not great for comparisons to the dinosaurs, who shared more in common with birds and mammals. We can effectively ignore all groups of dinosaurs besides the theropods because the rest have beaks. True, many also have teeth and evidence of rictal tissues that covered their jaws up to their beaks so that they could hold their food while they chewed, but they likely did not have the type of extraoral tissues we are discussing here. 
The part of the skull that is before or in front of the orbits or eye sockets is called the antorbital region. This part of the skull plays a ton of crucial roles in the biology of terrestrial vertebrates, breathing, smelling, and sensing, and capture and manipulation of food. The theropod dinosaurs are well known for carrying a set of large carnivorous cutting teeth, which has often led to reconstructions of the animals in scientific and pop culture settings, showing their teeth protruding from their closed mouths like snaggletooth slobbering crocodilian behemoths. Rather than behind extraoral tissues like almost every living backbone tetrapodal animal alive today, among the many arguments in favor of the interpretation of doofers sticking out from the jaws when they are slammed shut are the relatively large sizes of the teeth in the jaws of many theropods and also evidence from phylogenetic bracketing. Phylogenetic bracketing is a method of inference used in biological sciences. It is used to infer the likelihood of unknown traits in organisms based on their position in a phylogenetic tree. One of the main applications of phylogenetic bracketing is on extinct organisms, known only from fossils, going all the way back to the last universal common ancestor. With dinosaurs and the argument for liplessness, the phylogenetic bracketing would suggest that theropod dinosaurs were more likely to be lipless because crocs and birds are lipless. Though as stated earlier, birds must be thrown out because they have beaks and no teeth. Some more recent work on the neurovasculature of the snout of theropods argues that direct data and evidence is lacking for the presence of extraoral tissues. These studies do not make the claim that there is absolutely no evidence nor possibility for lip tissues in theropods, only that they lack really good proof of it but have found proof of the opposite. As it stands, theropod dinosaur teeth had rather thin layers of enamel. All dinosaurs were capable of replacing their old teeth with new ones and did so relatively often, somewhat similar to crocs and sharks. That being said, plenty of theropods have been shown to have kept their teeth in their mouths for quite long periods of time before they started to be pushed out by new ones. Having them around for these periods of time potentially exposed them to damage from desiccation or drying out and also from wear. Every good dentist's patient wants their teeth to be good and wet, just like me. Yeah, boy. So, a huge team of paleontologists led by Thomas Cullen and Derek Larson sought to further test multiple alternative hypotheses about what kind of extraoral tissues may have covered the pointed and jagged faces of the theropod dinosaurs using multiple lines of evidence such as dental histology, skull and tooth size regressions, and morphological comparisons. In living reptiles, there are two big, obvious anatomical patterns with regard to their teeth and the squishy bits that cover them. In the crocs, about a fourth of the tooth's crown height that extends beyond the lip edge of the jawbone is covered by fleshy gingiva, or what as normal folks might call the gums, the mucosal tissue that lies over the mandible and maxilla inside the mouth. The enamel-covered crown of the croc tooth is not covered by labial scales or the thin scaly lip tissues seen in lizards and snakes, which I will refer to as lepidosaurs from now on, since that is the group to which both of those groups belong, alongside the tuatara. When we take a closer look at the lepidosaurs, which are unfortunately quite a bit more distantly related to theropods than crocs are, we will see that the base of the teeth is similarly covered in gums as in crocs, but the enamel-covered portion of their teeth is covered extensively, and most of the time, entirely by labial scales when the mouth is closed. This is in every single lepidosaur too, even in ones that have enormous teeth like predatory varanid lizards, such as the crocodile monitor and komodo dragon. Something to note here, however, is that in both the lepidosaurs and non-avian theropod dinosaurs, the teeth are aligned straight downwards and under the lip of the jaws, while croc teeth angle slightly outwards. 
when phylogenetic bracketing is used, the absence of evidence for lips in birds and fossils from across the different groups would seem to support the hypothesis that theropods were lipless, like crocs. However, you run into a few issues if you only use extant phylogenetic bracketing to infer this hypothesis. Recent studies about croc faces have shown that the integument, or outzat squishy stuff, of the croc skull is highly derived for their specific semi-aquatic to aquatic lifestyles and sensory abilities. So, most animals have tiny holes in their skulls that act as passageways for nerves. These holes are called foramen, or foramina for plural. The foramina along the jaw margins in reptiles allows the passage of blood vessels and branches of the trigeminal nerve to any and all extraoral tissues along the jaw and the face. A semi-recent study found preserved passageways in the skull of Sue the Tyrannosaurus. Watch my video on that to learn more about what trigeminal nerves are. In crocs, the extraoral tissues that are present also house sensory organs that are widely distributed across their whole snout. It lets them sense physical vibrations in water and temperature changes. A prime observational example of how new, advanced, or derived this feature is in crocs lies in the compare and contrast between modern crocs and the very ancient extinct terrestrial crocs, like this Hesperosuchus. Hesperosuchus here seems to have holes in its jaws that are arranged in a neat line, and there are not a ton of different holes all over the skull. Modern crocs have tons of holes all over their skulls, and they are not arranged linearly. The teeth of Hesperosuchus also happen to be shaped exactly like those of theropod dinosaurs, a condition called xiphodont, in which they are laterally compressed, pointed, and with serrated edges the usual meat-eating steak knife comparison tooth. A broader comparison that considers a ton of living reptiles, as in this diagram, clearly shows that the jaws of theropods, such as tyrannosaurids, have a lot more in common with lizards and the extinct terrestrial crocs than any of them do with living crocs. This lines up very nicely with past work done that suggests foramina that are linearly aligned and few in number correspond quite strongly to critters with a lot of meat on their faces. Let's take another gander at dinosaur teeth. If you are at all familiar with my channel, you may already know what's up with teeth. And dino teeth, they are very cool, literally built different. For example, they are characterized by a relatively thin layer of enamel covering the crown of the tooth. This is not unique to dinosaurs. I may have just fibbed about their teeth being super weird and unusual. I just like them more than other teeth. Enamel is formed during the development of the tooth through the process called amelogenesis. The enamel cannot be regenerated or repaired once it is formed. Hence our dentists and most animals' replacement of teeth. For the theropod dinosaurs, the enamel is the same thickness on both sides of the flats of the blade and increases in thickness with the increase in body size of the animal. Crocs, on the other hand, have dummy thick layers of enamel in their teeth with thicker regions of their enamel towards the tip of the tooth. On top of that, dentine exposure is common in teeth and tusks that are constantly exposed to the environment. In order to investigate the dental histology or the microscopic biological structures of the teeth of large theropods in detail, the team of researchers removed a functional upper jaw tooth from a large Despletosaurus specimen and examined it for age and enamel ultrastructure in histological thin section under plane polarized and cross polarized light using a petrographic microscope. That means they cut a thin section out of the tooth, polished it down, glued it to a glass slide, and then polished that some more, and then slid it under a special microscope with special lenses. The thin section of the tooth confirmed that the tooth was fully developed and was consistent with a tooth replacement rate of one year, as has been confirmed in Tyrannosaurus. They also did not find any evidence of substantial amounts of wear. All in all, a good healthy adult tooth. 
Any of this is profound because wear on Tyrannosaurid teeth is rare, but when it occurs, it is present on the inside of the teeth from the upper jaw due to sliding against teeth from the lower jaw. In contrast, croc teeth erode on the outside, sometimes with extensive amounts of enamel coming clean off. Enamel itself has a relatively low water content, but remains hydrated and maintained in living terrestrial backbone enjoyers by the secretions of mouth glands, aka saliva. Saliva slows the decay of teeth and helps keep the enamel's elasticity and strength. Dry enamel is harder, but more brittle and stiffer, while wet enamel is resistant to physical damage, wear, and abrasion. Since there is a strong relationship between hydration and wear resistance, and considering how hard it is to stop the tooth from wearing down, if exposed, it is highly unlikely for functional teeth to remain uncovered and open to the environment unless they have some sort of special adaptations going on, like thick enamel something we know theropods did not have. In other words, if theropod teeth acted like those of crocs, we should see super thick layers of enamel that would protect the teeth long enough to be useful until they were pushed out by new teeth. And yet, what is seen in theropod teeth is that they were quite a bit like the teeth of most other reptiles. They had no adaptations to being constantly open to the environment and could not stand the weathering and abrasion of becoming dry and dusty, like the teeth of crocs can. This is a major blow for the lipless hypothesis. Another argument in favor of the lipless hypothesis is that the teeth of theropod dinosaurs, especially the huge mega predators like tyrannosaurids, were too large to have fit behind extraoral tissues. The new team of researchers plotted the logs of tooth height against the log of skull lengths of a bunch of living monitor lizards and extinct theropods, including Varanus primordius, Varanus salvadorii, Varanus comodiensis, Microraptor guai, Velociraptor mongoliensis, Coelophysis bori, Gorgosaurus libratus, and Tyrannosaurus rex. Although the noggins of the tyrannosaurids were massive, the regression lines on the plot demonstrate that the slopes here between the log values closely matches the relationships observed in living monitor lizards. This refutes the argument that theropod dinosaur teeth were too large to fit extraoral tissues over them. Plotting these data revealed that theropod and monitor teeth are almost the same size for their skull lengths and even grow in proportions at roughly the same pace. Yet it wasn't T-Rex that won the largest tooth contest. It was the Varanids. Several monitor species have almost cartoonishly enormous teeth, such as the crocodile monitor Varanus salvadorii. The research concludes that theropods did not need unusually huge lips to protect their mouths, and that the biggest theropods would resemble a Komodo dragon in terms of lip size. They observe that monitors may hide their teeth with the same fundamental structure of lip and gum tissues despite a 12-fold size variation. The difference in size between the biggest monitor skull and the largest theropod skull is just half that, six-fold. Thus, if lizard lips and gums can scale 12 times without significant anatomical change, might they also expand to cover the teeth of much larger creatures without much modification? Given the profusion of lippy, monitor-esque mosasaur reconstructions, many of us clearly feel this is plausible whether we realize it or not. These comparisons show that extraoral tissues of non-avian theropods were more like those of living lepidosaurs and other tetrapods than those of birds or crocs, and that the faces of living archosaurs do not accurately reflect the ancestral condition of the archosaurian clade. The results of this study strongly support lipped facial reconstructions in theropods, with wide-reaching implications for their portrayal in science and popular culture. More importantly, the presence of extensive extraoral tissues has implications for tooth strength, feeding ecology, and biomechanics, and therefore may have played an important role in how carnivorous theropod dinosaur teeth resisted forces associated with feeding close to the bone, 
and even may have permitted carcass dismemberment while reducing spalling in large tyrannosaurids. Finally, they posit a lepidosaur-like plesiomorphic condition for extraoral tissues in Dinosauria and expect that the results not only will provide a deeper understanding of the evolution of buccal soft tissues generally and advanced oral processing in ornithischians in particular, but also, more broadly, will open new directions of research into the relationships between oral soft tissues and feeding behavior in terrestrial vertebrates with large teeth. These scientists also highlighted another issue as a consequence of their attempts to rebuild a scientifically accurate image of a lipless Tyrannosaurus. It's exceedingly difficult, if not impossible, to shut theropod jaws without lips. Creating an oral seal, even if it is as simple as squeezing lipless jaws against one another, is essential for preventing dehydration and maintaining basic dental health and cleanliness. They were unable, however, to reconstruct T. rex jaws without a gap between the maxillary teeth. One of the researchers, Dr. Mark Witten, actually pushed the lipless reconstruction beyond what he felt was acceptable, and it still has a little hole. The team was not the first to consider this question, and dinosaur literature has conflicting opinions on how far theropods could shut their jaws. Some scientists argue that theropod mandibles might have been dragged all the way up into the cavity of the upper jaw and have even found markers for the lower teeth's resting posture. They include depressions in the upper oral chamber's walls and roof that seem to be adapted to acting as socket-like structures for receiving the lower dentition, like in this Tyrannosaurus maxilla fragment and this full Chianchaosaurus skull. Others, more notably Tyler Kyler in his superb 2013 book chapter on recreating the face of the Tyrannosaurus Jane, have questioned this hypothesis claiming that theropod mandibles couldn't shut that tightly without practically slamming into issues. Reconstructing the face of T-Rex for the new paper saw the team agreeing with Tyler's conclusions. Theropod lower jaws collide with bones under the eye socket, specifically the ectopterygoid, at a certain point of mouth closure, requiring further adduction either to require the jaws to literally crush themselves shut or else the bones of the posterior skull act as a hinge, swinging the jaw tip into the mouth but dislocating the jaw joint. Researcher Tracy Ford argued in 1997 that an ectopterygoid notch accommodated the closed lower jaw during mouth closure, but the team did not believe this was possible. Theropod ectopterygoids may have complicated forms, and although some contain spaces that seem to cradle the lower jaw, they were very definitely filled by deep jaw muscles in life. There are theropod skulls preserved in the fossil record with their jaws tightly shut, but one must be cautious in thinking they reflect in life circumstances given how normal processes of decay and fossilization may strain and compress corpses into strange configurations. Motivated by this, the crew discussed how theropods posed their locked jaws in life. Other than ruling out absurd, jaw-busting combinations, it's difficult to determine how firmly theropods held their lips, but this is something artists should think about. X-rays and scans of lizard corpses demonstrate that their jaws are not squeezed tight when their mouths are closed, and their upper and lower teeth barely overlap in some species. If one goes full lizard with their theropod reconstructions with limited overlap of the upper and lower tooth rows, the lips would have been deeper and the snouts would have been considerably higher than we're accustomed to. Dr. Witten was intrigued by the blocky, chunky cranial profile of the lizard-like, loose-mouthed T-Rex after the researchers experimented with it in their paper. Putting all of this together, their investigations of jaw structure, tooth size, tooth wear, and jaw closing all point to the same inference, that theropod jaws don't make much anatomical or functional sense without lips of some kind. To validate the alternative lipless model, you have to engage in a lot of special pleading and scientific weaseling. Exposed theropod teeth would have to be unprecedentedly resistant to wear. 
all understanding of jaw structure and foramina distribution correlating with oral soft tissues would have to be wrong, and theropods would need to be unique in not bothering to adapt oral seals. As Dr. Witten states in his article write-up about this study, if we're being good scientists, we can't currently say that theropods definitely had lips, drop the microphone and walk off stage, but I think we've made it far more challenging for anyone to legitimately object to the lipped theropod hypothesis. Time will tell on that front. In addition to substantiating the lipped hypothesis of theropod appearance, the hope is that this paper may establish some lines of inquiry for the oral tissues of other extinct animals. Many of the most extreme dentitions to ever evolve belong to fossil taxa, after all, and theropods are far from the only species with uncertain facial appearances. What of Nimravids, Gorgonopsians, Uintetheres, or Thylacosmilus? And what for that matter of these superficially crocodile-like spinosaurids and other weird theropods? Were they lipped or not? If these ideas hold water, they provide a relatively straightforward way of deducing whether the teeth of these animals were held within oral tissues. As Dr. Witten continues, stating that the team concluded that lepidosaurs, the lizards, snakes, and tuataras are the best modern analog for theropod lips and gums. This is, admittedly, a best of a bad situation recommendation because there are plenty of differences between theropod and lepidosaur jaws that preclude total confidence in their comparison. But there is only so many living reptile groups to choose from and lepidosaurs are, on the whole, morphologically closer to theropods in areas thought to be influential on lip and gum tissues. This being the case, Dr. Witten and company's model for theropod mouths is that they were sealed by non-muscular lips covered with scales, or to hedge bets a little more, whatever epidermal covering was present on the side of the snout. I said before that lizards have just scales and skin for lips, but this is not true of all lizard snakes and tuataras. Some agamid lizards have muscles that move their lips or flaps of mouth-adjacent skin for communicative purposes. Bearded dragons are very lippy. Not quite as snarly as mammals, but far more mobile in their mouths than most lizards. As Dr. Witten continues, lepidosaurs show variation in lip size, with most having generous upper lips, but some having thinner lower lips than others. This variation continues to their gums. Lepidosaur gums are more voluminous than those of mammals and crocs, and generally cover at least 20-25% to or so of the tooth crown height. This is why lizard teeth aren't always that visually obvious in their open mouths. Monitors take these enlarged gums to an extreme, hiding almost all of their formidable teeth with enormous gums. There is currently not much insight into where theropods sat within this range. In 2019, Gregory S. Paul, independently of this new study, advocated for full monitor-like conditions for theropods, and this might be possible, but smaller gums, or indeed a unique theropod intake on oral soft tissues, cannot be ruled out at this time. Dr. Witten and company propose, however, that since living lipped reptiles have at least 25% of their tooth crown heights covered with gums, we should apply that to theropods too. Elephant in the Room One of the co-authors of the new lip paper is Robert Rice. I don't entirely believe in bringing in personal stuff that happens amongst scientists and co-workers and colleagues into my science videos because it is usually irrelevant to the topic being discussed. However, this particular inclusion of this particular scumbag deserves note. The full story is far too long and far too complex for this video, so I will post a link to the article written about the series of incidents occurring between Rice and his colleagues and the students working under him in the description and comment section below. Robert is accused of a list of allegations for which extinct amphibian researcher Dr. Brian Gee, though I'm not sure if he is a doctor or a doctor student at this time due to these incidences, and Yara Herity, an evolutionary biologist, have provided plenty of screenshots and receipts for, 
Their accusations are legit and backed up with evidence. In short, Robert has been abusive to Brian, Yara, and plenty of other students and colleagues who have been unable to come forward for various reasons. Rice sexually and non-sexually harassed, bullied, and verbally abused G and Herity and others. Please, I implore you to go read the entirety of the article write up about the details if you are skeptical. As of writing the script for this video, none of the authors of this new lip study have come forward to denounce their co-author. I do not hold ill will towards them. If there are some weird loopholes or rules with regard to the paper and its publication that restricted them from taking Rice off the paper, and I am not entirely sure if he should if he was involved with the paper on practical grounds. On ethical grounds, I believe he should, should be suspended, fired, and no one should work with him ever again. But that is neither here nor there. I am making a statement here that I do not condone him, and I am disappointed in the rest of the authors looking the other way, somewhat in a similar way as to how the Emily Willoughby eugenics incident went down a few months or a year ago. Another story for another time. For more interesting stories about nature, the history of life, or what goes bump in the night, subscribe, like this video, drop a comment in the comment section below, and hit the bell icon to stay in the know with everything Edge. Thanks for watching. Special thanks to Elephant Tier patrons Abby Smith, Arda Bayer, Biotiverse, Cherry Shaw, Chris Frampton, Christoph Hubbinger, Dinosaur, Ed Peretz, Isaiah Garza, Jax the Hacks, Natty Cat, PA Brew News, Ray, Rudy Redgrave, Smiling Walrus, Staniforth Hopkins, Steve Bradshaw, Thea Svensson, and Extraterrestrial as well as my top as tier Tyrannosaurus patrons, Admin, Antron, Aphid Kirby, Cyber, Dana Manchester, Danny Van Heck, Henry Brennan, Iberospinus, Iron Bladesman, Joshua Mana, Panic, Radio 404, Robert Kessler, Ruben Zachariah, Swaffles is Weird, Teeny Dragator, and The Dogman.